This is Endangered Species Act as a pesticide reform tool. Uh, glad you're here. Sorry for any scheduling or room confusion difficulties this morning, uh, but we're, we're glad that you made it. We're going to start the panel by talking about the differences between National Environmental Policy Act and the federal insecticide, fungicide. No, ESA. 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 Endangered Species Act. Federal Differences like between ESA and the different gotcha. um, We're They're going to see how these translate into different scientific questions uh, with regard to pesticide evaluations. Um, this is going to lead into a discussion on legal strategies for using ESA. And then finally, uh, looking at how smaller cases um, using ESA were then uh, scaled up into larger cases. We're going to follow the panel with Q&A. It's going to last for about 15 minutes there at the end, so if you'll save your questions, we'll try to get to all those. Uh, panelists are Jason Rylander from Defenders of Wildlife, May Code from the Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides, Amanda Gooden from Earth Justice, and Colette Atkins EC from the Center for Biological Diversity. Jason earned a BA in Government from Cornell University and a JD from the William & Mary School of Law, where he served as an editor of both the William & Mary Law Review and the Environmental Law and Policy Review for joining Defenders in 2005, where he now litigates endangered species and habitat preservation cases. Jason served as litigation and policy counsel for Community Rights Council and as an associate at the law firm of Perkins and Coy LLP. May earned a Master's of Science in Environmental Health and Toxicology from Oregon State University in 2000. She also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Northern Arizona University with interdisciplinary focus on international relations and environmental studies. She joined the NCAP staff in 2000 after working with the Peace Corps in Honduras to promote organic gardening and educate communities about pesticide risks. Prior to NCAP, she also worked with the National Pesticide Telecommunications Network, which is an EPA-funded education group. Amanda joined Earth Justice in October 2008 after clerking for the United States Court of Appeals Judge Diana Griffin in Baltimore, Maryland. Amanda graduated cum laude from the New York University School of Law in 2007. During law school, Amanda was an articles editor for the NYU Law Review and published a note on the use of eminent domain. And then Colette received her law degree from the University of Montana, where she also Minnesota. earned... Huh? Minnesota. University of Minnesota. Oh, sorry. About that. <laughs> uh, where she also earned a master's degree in wildlife conservation before joining, uh, joining the Center for Biological Diversity. Colette was in private practice where her pro bono work focused on preservation of endangered species and their habitats. She also served as a law clerk to the Honorable John R. Tunheim in the U.S. District Court for the District of Minnesota. Right? That's right. Cool. Um, each of these panelists is going to have 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to start with Jason. Great. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be back out here in Eugene, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to go through a short, um, hopefully very short, uh, presentation about the differences uh, between the Endangered Species Act and FIFRA in terms of the way uh, both statutes approach endangered species issues and risk assessment issues, and then hopefully uh, be quiet so that some of the more interesting presentations can take up more time. Um, all right. So we all know, I think the purpose of the Endangered Species Act is to conserve endangered and threatened species. There are 300, actually about 1,380 some odd listed species now in, in the United States, and uh, the authority for managing them is divided between the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA National Marine Fisheries. The heart of the Endangered Species Act is a Section 7 consultation process, and the key language there is that each federal agency shall ensure that any action authorized, funded, or carried out by an agency is not likely to jeopardize the continued existence of any endangered or threatened species or result in the modification of its critical habitat. That term, jeopardizing the continued existence, is defined as to reduce appreciably the likelihood of both the survival and recovery of a listed species in the wild by reducing the reproduction numbers or distribution. In order to avoid jeopardy to a species or critical habitat, the services work with the action agency uh, to develop reasonable and prudent alternatives that can protect the species and to minimize any further harm to the species will develop reasonable and prudent measures, which could include like no spray zones around streams to protect salmon. The end result of a consultation process, if there's a determination that there may be an effect to endangered species, is a biological opinion that would contain the specific RPAs and RPMs that's issued at the end of the consultation process, um, and then theoretically the agency and um, uh, any other groups that would be affected by it would follow those recommendations. In the landmark case of TVA versus Hill, 
which dealt with the Section 7 consultation, uh, the Supreme Court made clear that when looking at risk under the Endangered Species Act and assessing whether projects are going to jeopardize a species, the balance has been struck in favor of affording endangered species the highest of priorities. And they talk about institutionalized caution, or as we often refer to it as the precautionary principle, which really underlies a lot of the way the ESA is supposed to work, where there's doubt, uh, where there's uncertainty, the benefit of the doubt should go to the species itself when you're making regulatory decisions. FIFRA is a completely different animal. FIFRA sets forth a comprehensive regulatory scheme that is supposed to ensure that there is no unreasonable risk for people or the environment from a pesticide. The key word there is unreasonable. So automatically start thinking, well, what is a reasonable risk? And you realize that FIFRA is a cost-benefit analysis statute. It is not at all the same as the ESA. The heart of FIFRA's regulatory scheme is this registration requirement. So the way FIFRA works is um, it's prohibited to sell a pesticide unless it has first been registered by the EPA for specific uses, um, uh, user uses. The registration results in an EPA approval of a label, which functions as a federal permit that details the approved use and any constraints to prevent harm to the environment and human health. So at its heart, FIFRA is kind of a labeling statute, not an environmental statute, even though it contains uh, language that requires some environmental review. One of the problems that we run into is that once a pesticide is registered, EPA uh, and the manufacturers treat that label as sacrosanct and will not modify it without either the approval of the registrant or through a formal FIFRA cancellation process that can take a lot of time to go through. So, um, you know, new information comes out that says a species might be harmed. EPA is not likely to do anything about it. And that's a real problem under FIFRA. The registration standard, as I mentioned, does not generally cause unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. This is a cost-benefit analysis that can allow harmful pesticides to be registered if, in their view, the economic benefits of that pesticide outweigh the environmental harms. Another problem with FIFRA is that the application process is really manufacturer-driven. So the manufacturer submits all the information about the chemical composition, the modes of action, the proposed uses, and the potential harm humans and the environment. And EPA relies very heavily on manufacturer submitted studies when it's doing its own risk assessments on these pesticides. EPA does have, under FIFRA, an ongoing duty to review registrations and respond to information about pesticide effects. Uh, but as I indicated, it's very difficult to get EPA to actually take action. Every 15 years or so, pesticides that are registered go through a re-registration review but there's still a kind of a burden of proof or a benefit of the doubt that's given to, the, to an existing registration for that registration to continue, rather than looking afresh at new information every time they re-register it. And so when you do propose cancellation, as I've been involved in a couple of cancellation proceedings over carbofuran and uh, also to try to prevent uh, the registration and uh, use of rosol on prairie dogs throughout the West, um, the standard for cancellation is similar. Whenever it appears that a pesticide or its labeling um, does not comply with the provisions of the Act or when used in accordance with widespread and commonly recognized practice generally causes unreasonable adverse effects on the environment, EPA can go ahead and try to cancel that. But there is a long administrative procedure that usually takes place. Uh, there are a lot of appeals that the manufacturers are entitled to. Typically, there will be a science advisory panel that will be set up to review um, whether uh, the pesticide should be canceled and review the materials pro and con, and this literally can take years. And during that period of time, EPA does have the authority to suspend or enjoin the use of the pesticide, but only if they can show that there's been an imminent hazard to its continued use, which, to my knowledge, has never happened. So what does this matter? Uh, why does this all matter? Uh, FIFRA and ESA obviously contain very different mandates for species protection and also for ecological risk assessment. And this fundamental difference in the treatment of uncertainty leads to differences in the way they approach risk. Uh, type 1 errors are you know, this, the, the sort of false positive that can lead to regulation where it may not be necessary. Uh, EPA focuses mostly on that. Type 2 errors are those where you don't see an effect, but there may still be one, and those can result in less protection than necessary. So. Under the Endangered Species Act, the key duty is to ensure that a species is not jeopardized. That burden of proof 
is on you know, the precautionary principle is about minimizing those type two errors. Um, and so consistent with ESA's congressional director and case law, like TVA v. Hill, Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMS generally give the benefit of the doubt to the species when uncertainty exists. And this is obvious because for ESA species, the consequences of being wrong about an impact can lead to the extinction of that species. So just to sum up, and I'll, I'll, there are other things I want to talk about, uh, but I, I want to make sure that, that we hear about some specific examples about how this, how this is working in practice. Uh, the ESA's key concept is to ensure against jeopardy, whereas FIFRA's concept is unreasonable adverse effect. And uh, the way EPA has interpreted that, uh, rarely are endangered and threatened species given the d direct specific consideration uh, that is required under FIFRA. Uh, and especially this is true when, when EPA has, has been the case too many times, uh, fails to consult with the wildlife agencies under ESA um, impacts to endangered species may, may be ignored completely. Well, I'm going to take where, where Jason left off. And he discussed these, you know, these two very different laws, and I want to bring it to how do agencies interpret those laws and how do they actually implement them, and show that how very different the science is at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on ecological risk assessment as it compares to the National Marine Fisheries Service and how they do ecological risk assessment for the Endangered Species Act. And um, very quickly, I'm only talking, you know, as he had up on the screen, the vast majority of endangered species are Fish and Wildlife Service, and, and Fish and Wildlife Service is the one that is charged with protecting them. But because there's been such an overarching failure from EPA to actually consult on the risks of pesticides posed, we don't have a consultation in the last 20 years from Fish and Wildlife Service. So I'm going to be, when I talk about that, I am going to talk about. But then Colette and Amanda get to talk about how we're moving that agenda forward in the, in the courts. So hopefully. We will. <laughs> oh, no. It's there. So first I'm going to talk about EPA and how they do their ecological risk assessments. And I mean, Jason outlined it perfectly. There is acceptable risk under FIFRA. There is a presumed benefit to using pesticides. And therefore, when they do an ecological risk assessment, they're really using very blunt instruments. Um, they're using scientific tools that are both old, but that's what the you know, CFRs, the Code of Federal Regulation, mandates under FIFRA. And when I talk about blunt instruments, they're, they're looking at obvious effects. Um, what they, they term un observable effects. And really, one of the driving forces in ecological risk assessment is death. I mean, it's, it's you know, really, it's, it's that, right. it's obvious. Um, you'll see scattered through these lethal, you see LC50, LD50, that's a lethal concentration or a lethal dose that will kill 50% of a population. They take that number and say, okay, well, this is probably a problem amount. And then they say, well, what amount can there be? Where can we have an, a acceptable risk here. And then they drop the amount that can be found in your environment in order that it doesn't hit that 50% death rate. There are other observable effects that they look at. They're still nowhere near where today's science is. But they, they'll look at a single generation reproductive effects. If a female is exposed, what happens to offspring? Are there fewer offspring? Are they um, less strong? Are they, what's their birth weight? Um, swimming strength in salmon and other fish. But they're not looking at the subtle effects, and they're also not looking at real-world exposures. Um, they, like, they use contained and controlled testing that's reproducible in a lab. And the most obvious example of that is that they look at single chemicals. So basically, if you have a, in, in pesticides, you have an active ingredient. They talk about this active ingredient, which is the ingredient that's there to control or kill the pest. And then they formulate the product and they add things to make that active ingredient more effective, to make it last longer, to make it adhere to surfaces, to make it absorb into things. Well, those other ingredients, called inert ingredients, have their own toxicological concern. And they also can increase the toxicity of that active ingredient. But the vast majority, 75% of wildlife tests that the manufacturers provide to EPA are done solely on, and that's what EPA is evaluating, are done solely on that active ingredient. So we're really missing a big portion of the problem. Uh, 
And then there's just everyday reality of that we're not exposed to a single pesticide. We're not exposed to a single chemical in the environment. You know, when you look at the monitoring of our waters, you can see up to 38 different wastewater contaminants in a stream at any given time. They're finding, you know, multiple pesticides. 90% of the time they're finding multiple pesticides in our streams. So EPA system really hones in on what is reproducible, looks at really obvious effects, and um, accepts a certain level of risk. And that's very different. And that's how they interpret FIFRA, and that's how FIFRA is, is fulfilled. Um, very different than the way the National Marine Fisheries Service does ecological evaluations and perform that consultation process, as Jason talked about, to, to meet Endangered Species Act requirements. You know, simply put, in the Endangered Species Act, the burden of risk cannot be borne by the species. I mean, this is what Jason talked about. So if there is a risk, that means the action, the you know, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency registering a pesticide has to bear the risk. Because if the species bears the risk, the, there's a potential for extinction. And so what that means on the ground is the National Marine Fisheries Service cannot afford to underestimate risk. So they really want to understand what are the impacts and because they, they are there to help not only maintain but actually restore these populations. They don't just, they look at a broader set of data to start out. EPA looks at manufacturer produced or manufacturer data. <coughs> Under the Endangered Species Act, you have to look at the best available commercial and scientific information. So that means they're looking at peer review data. They're looking at gray data. They're, they're gray, gray papers. They're looking, at, they're looking all over. They're pooling from universities, from private firms, as well as that manufacturer data because the reality is the vast majority of information about pesticides is generated by those manufacturers, but they're going beyond that. And, and they are looking at real world, world, the real world um, assessments. They're looking at baseline data. They look at what chemicals are already in these, what is it, what's already in the habitats. Um, they look at the temperature of the streams because pesticides, their toxicity changes with temperature. So in some of their consultations and their biological opinions, they had to increase the potential risk because there were temperature compromised streams increasing and, you know, the, which increased the toxicity of the pesticides and it was an external stressor on salmon because the, the temperature is also a stressor for salmon. So they're looking at what are the, what's an environmental baseline? What are the risks that salmon are already exposed to? What stresses are already there? Now, what does that mean when you add a pesticide to that? As compared to EPA, which has their blinders on and says, what's the impact of this active ingredient on a species without looking at what else is around them. Um, and they're looking at chemical mixtures. I think I talked about that. The other big piece is they're not just looking at these obvious observable effects. They're really trying to understand and, and see greater concerns. One of the, I, about 10 years ago, the, this, there was a science that came out talking about, so there are pesticides that hinder a salmon's ability to smell. Fine, okay, I have a cold, I can't smell, whatever, my, you know, my spaghetti didn't taste very good tonight. But that's not quite the same for salmon. When, you know, when, when the National Marine Fisheries Service recognized this concern, they realized salmon use their sense of smell to find their natal stream, to spawn, to avoid predators. So the simple fact that they were unable to smell different pheromones and different things in the water meant that, yes, they were jeopardized. But that kind of study, that wouldn't have even entered into an EPA evaluation. Um, they're also looking at indirect effects. So fine, a, a certain amount of pesticide had nothing to do, did nothing to that salmon. But guess what? It killed off a huge percentage of the insects, the aquatic insects that those salmon feed on. Fine, the salmon were fine, but yet they're not going to be because their food sources disappeared. And you know, it seems really obvious that you would have to look at that, but that's not the way FIFRA works. Um, so what does it mean? Okay, they do things differently. So FIFRA has, needs to do a lot of, we really need to improve FIFRA. But actually, we really need to harmonize these laws. We need to figure out a way for the EPA to ma match up with these Endangered <coughs> Species Act um, requirements. And then there's two real reasons that we need to figure out how to, to deal with this clash of these two particular laws. The one reason is because a consultation starts at the action agency. EPA is the action agency. It is taking an action, registering a pesticide that may harm a species. 
effect. So they do the first evaluation. If EPA finds no effect using their FIFRA models, they close the file cabinet and they never even talk to the wildlife services. So if they've underestimated risk, nothing's going to happen. And, well, I'm already pretty certain that they've done that on a couple chemicals. So we have, but that's, that's another lawsuit for another day. <laughs> so um, we need to make sure that EPA is using the appropriate tools to evaluate and answer the correct questions and not answering FIFRA questions, but answering these ESA questions. Secondly, the two agencies disagree. They disagree on risk. EPA thinks there's not a problem or there's a very minimal problem. National Marine Fisheries Service thinks there is a problem. Well, now we're at a place, and Amanda will talk about this when we talk about all of our legal work, where EPA refuses to implement the protections that, are, that have been required by National Marine Fisheries Service. So if we, can get, if we can get some sort of a unity and actually get EPA to recognize where the where actual risks, we can hopefully move forward on getting protections put on the ground. And lastly, I mean, something that I hope, and this might be, you know, I might be a little old lady at this conference talking about it, but salmon and endangered species are, are vulnerable populations, but there's a lot of other vulnerable populations. And if we can get EPA to move the way they're doing the ecological risk assessment, at some point, they're going to have to do the same thing for farmers and for our children, and they're going to have to shift the way that they are doing their their evaluations. And so I, I know um, a friend who works on farm worker issues, and he said, farm workers are salmon too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you only understand that if you said. <laughs> so hopefully we can get there. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, who's going to talk about some of the legal work that's allowing these consultations to start. Um, so I'm Amanda Gooden, and I'm an attorney with Earth Justice. Um, and as Amy mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about um, the pesticide and salmon litigation. Uh, it's been ongoing for over a decade now. Um, pretty pretty continuous litigation, it feels like. A few little breaks in there, but um, a lot of different lawsuits. And this is really a story of um, tremendous victory in court, um, consistent victories in court, but uh, unfortunately uh, a lot of resistance and um, a, a real failure of implementation so far in terms of actual on the ground protections. Although we are we are closer than we've ever been, and we're still making progress, but it's it's an interesting contrast between the the repeated court wins and yet the continued um, failure to really have the on the ground protections that it's been clear we've needed for so long. Um, so uh, I guess the backdrop here: um, salmon and steelhead. There are 28 stocks that are listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act up and down the Pacific Coast. Um, and these runs are are in a lot of trouble right now. Um, they are just at fractions of their historic abundance. Um, for example, the Columbia River uh, salmon and steelhead stocks are at about uh, two percent of their historic runs. So these are really, really no, low numbers. These are species that we, uh, you know, we really need to take major steps to protect uh, if we want them to be around much longer. Um, and there are a number of factors that are contributing to these uh, declines, and pesticide use is one of them. Um, pesticide runoff from agricultural applications into the stream before spit salmon come to spawn. Um, so back in, I think this litigation originated in the, the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, 2000 was when it was wild, yeah. Um, I came into Anchor and then it started. And then it started right there. Right. Yeah. Um, I grew up with Sam. Excellent. Um, a, uh, a coalition of environmental groups um, brought suit against the National Marine Fisheries Service um, and against EPA for failing to consult on the pesticide uh, registrations and re-registrations. For decades, these pesticides have been registered for use um, throughout the northwest of the country without any ESA consultation. Um, so this initial lawsuit was just to establish that a pesticide registration or re-registration is, in fact, an action under the ESA that is subject to consultation, and that when EPA takes that action, they are required to go to NIMS and to consult and to uh, you know, determine the effect of those pesticides uh, on endangered species. Um, and so that, uh, that case was resolved in 2002 in the Western District of Washington, um, and in a fantastic opinion, um, we got uh, an opinion saying that, it, yes, it did violate the Endangered Species Act, this failure to consult uh, for at least 54 specific pesticides, um, and that, you know, EPA would have to go and consult with NIMS um, as to how those were affecting salmon. And 
Uh, that case dealt with those 54, it, there were more than 54 pesticides at issue initially, but those 54 were the ones where there was uh, more evidence um, on the record that was already available showing that they were going to have uh, an adverse effect on salmon or might have an adverse effect on salmon. But it did set this, this precedent that, wait a minute, these pesticide consultations or these pesticide registrations as a general matter are something that uh, you know, is subject to consultation and that you know, this is a step that, that needs to happen here for, for all of these potentially. Um, and as part of that initial uh, victory, that, that first case, the court um, issued an injunction setting some uh, interim protections until this consultation could take place. Um, so the court ordered uh, buffer zones around uh, salmon bearing streams and said, okay, you cannot uh, apply pesticides within these specific buffers um, and, and ordered that that, uh, that injunction would stay in place until consultation was complete for the 54 pesticides. Um, so, you know, then, then the consulta consultation process slowly started rolling and um, by 2004, uh, NIMS had, uh, had reached a likely to adverse, adversely affect determination for 37 of those pesticides. Um, and that's kind of the, the threshold determination would be either, as I may mentioned, the no effect, which is oh, there's nothing, nothing's going to happen at all. And really, no effects are supposed to be limited to kind of a situation where the, the pesticide use in the species don't even coincide. So a pesticide that's used only in New York probably isn't going to affect Pacific Coast salmon. But if there's any, any possibility of an effect, then you either should be in a not likely to adversely affect a determination, which is, well, there may be some effect, but we don't think it's a really big deal, or the likely to adversely affect determination, which is, well, there actually may be a problem here, and we're going to have to take a much closer look at this through the formal consultation process. So there were 37 likely to adversely affect pesticides of those initial uh, 54. Um, and so we got to the point that those determinations were made and then stalled out again uh, because NIMS and Fish and Wildlife Service and EPA entered into or promulgated these counter counterpart regulations. So there are regulations that govern the consultation process generally for um, Fish and Wildlife Service and, and NIMS nationwide. But uh, agencies can work with the services to adopt more specific uh, requirements for a kind of a set of consultations, and that's what EPA and NIMS and Fish and Wildlife Service did for the pesticide consultations. They said, okay, this is how this is going to work um, just for pesticide consultations. And the counterpart regulations were really pretty terrible, they're kind of a joke. Um, <laughs> they. A gift from the Bush administration. They what? A gift from the Bush administration. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a special gift. Um, <laughs> they, you know, so the Endangered Species Act, as you heard from Jason, says, the action agency needs to consult with Fish and Wildlife Service and with NIMS and uh, ensure that there's no jeopardy in consultation with the services. These counterpart regulations, though, try to basically pull the services out of the equation and let EPA unilaterally make not likely to adversely affect determinations. So if they looked and said, well, there's going to be an effect, but really we don't think it's a very big deal, um, EPA could just then close the file on that and say, that's it, services don't even need to sign off on it. And as you just heard from May May, EPA looks at a much, much, much narrower range of topics um, when they're making that initial determination. So if they're, if they're closing the books, they haven't even, they haven't looked at all the relevant things yet. So a similar coalition of environmental groups brought suit again and said these counterpart regulations are not going to cut it, these are not adequately protecting species. Uh, and this was another suit in the Western District of Washington. I have uh, sites for all these if anyone is interested. Um, and once again, we got a great decision out of the Western District of Washington saying, yep, these counterpart regulations are no good. When the ESA says you have to consult with the services, that means you do actually have to consult with them. You can't just <laughs> silence, no communication, that's not consultation. Um, and that opinion also contains a great discussion of the differences between the services um, assessment process through consultation and uh, the ESA or EPA's um, pesticide risk assessment process and really highlights a lot of the ways that EPA's process is really deficient and leads to an overall underprotection of species. So then that got us to about 2006 and so we said okay well great now we're finally going to get some consultations and uh, another year or so rolls by and still nothing. So we said, okay, brought suit again against NIMS for unreasonable delay and failing to actually complete any of these consultations. And um, that lawsuit settled. I think maybe they realized they were a little 
vulnerable on that issue. Um, so we sat down and worked out a schedule with them that said, okay, for these 37 you know, pesticides where you have a likely to adversely affect determination, here's when you need to complete the biops and let's really get moving on these. Let's address the most serious ones first, but come on guys, get us, get us some consultations. Um, so then pursuant to that settlement in 2008, we finally got our first biological opinion. Um, and it was on three organophosphate pesticides, uh, three of the ones that um, we thought would have kind of the most substantial effects on salmon. And the biop came out and found that all three were likely to jeopardize Pacific salmon and steelhead. Um, I believe it was jeopardy determinations for 27 of the 28 listed stocks, and then for 26 of the 28, it was also the, the use of those pesticides was also going to be likely to adversely modify the critical habitat for those species. So really pretty overwhelming finding. Um, and that biop also included some specific reasonable and prudent alternatives, which is the, the term under the ESA for mitigation measures, basically. And the, those measures included some very substantial buffer zones, um, some studies, and no applications in you know, particularly windy days, things like that. But a number of steps, um, the most significant of which was, were these large buffer zones um, to prevent really harmful concentrations of these pesticides from getting into salmon waters. Um, and this 2008 biop was followed by another in 2009 on three carbamates. Um, and we've had two more uh, since then. I think we're at a total of 24 pesticides that, that we now have biops for. Um, so we said, great, we've got these biops. We've got some RPAs. Excellent. Finally, we're, we're getting somewhere. Um, and EPA took a look at the biological opinions and the RPAs and said, mm, nope. no thanks. <laughs> no, not interested. Um, so they sent a letter to NIMP saying, you know, we really think your RPAs are, are awfully harsh. I mean, these buffer zones are really pretty big, and we think instead of implementing them, we're going to do a whole lot less. And NIMPS responded and said, actually, no, that's, that's not what we said. <laughs> you really need to do more. Um, and things stalled out there again. EPA not only did not implement what NIMPS said they should implement, they didn't even implement these smaller uh, buffers that they said they thought were more appropriate. Um, so again, total stall, and again, another lawsuit from uh, another similar group of environmental organizations and, and fishing organizations, <laughs> some of whom are represented at this table, um, uh, a, a suit against EPA uh, for failing to put these protections in place. And that litigation is ongoing in the Western District of Washington. Um, at the same time, the pesticide manufacturers brought a case in uh, Maryland, of all places, a very logical place to litigate West Coast salmon issues. I think perhaps they were sick of losing in the Western District yeah. of Washington. Um, <laughs> they brought a case uh, challenging the very first biop that came out, the 2008 organophosphate biop, um, and you know, raising a whole host of reasons that they thought this biop was substantively and procedurally improper. Um, and in that litigation, uh, we already have a district court opinion upholding the biop and saying, you know, no, this was not arbitrary and capricious. Uh, the services biop is fine. Um, and they have appealed that decision to the Fourth Circuit, and we're in the middle of briefing that case right now. Um, so, so it is, you know, it's been it's been over a decade of litigation now, um, and we have these biops now, and we have these fantastic uh, protective measures in the biops. Uh, we still do not have them implemented on the ground, those measures, but, but we are definitely a lot closer than we ever, ever have been. Um, but there is, there's been some substantial pushback throughout this process, and that's having a few interesting and, and problematic effects. Um, first, NIMS has been getting so much pushback on these biops from EPA and from industry that we have seen uh, the biops get weaker as they've been coming out. So the very first organophosphate biop, the one that um, industry is suing over in the Fourth Circuit right now, um, that one uh, was very strong. And as we're now in the fourth biop, we've seen kind of over the course of the four an erosion really of NIMS's, NIMS's position. And I think it's a result of the overwhelming pressure and pushback they've been getting on these biops. And so uh, that is that is obviously very concerning. We're seeing them consult on a slightly narrower um, action, kind of more more what uh, how the pesticides are typically used instead of the actual label. We've seen them kind of back off in the strength of the mitigation measures that they recommend in the biops. 
Um, and so we, of course, are working to, to push back on NIFS and say, no, no, you know, you guys need to, to keep these strong. But um, definitely, we are seeing some erosion there as a result of all the pressure. Um, and then there are a few other um, concerning <laughs> concerning effects, I think, of, um, of how successful our litigation has been. Um, we have seen a large number of riders introduced in Congress, um, attempts to gut the ESA generally, but also some very, very specific <coughs> riders targeted at these biops and this litigation, things like, you know, EPA may not spend any money to implement any of the salmon and pesticide biops and just really yank their authority to do anything about these findings. Um, none of those have gone through yet, but they do, they seem to keep cropping up and it's a huge battle um, on the Hill every time one of those does arise. Um, because in just, through the house. Yeah, some have gotten through the House, but none have actually gotten through the, through the Senate yet. But um, pesticide manufacturers are outspending us by an outstanding margin. They have a lot of people they can afford to have a huge number of people on the Hill kind of pushing, um, pushing for these riders and talking about, oh, the poor farmers and they can't protect their crops and uh, they've been making a, a lot of noise. So that is a, that is a constant threat also. Um, and as a result of this kind of longstanding conflict between EPA and uh, NIMS, um, there is now, and as a kind of also a result of the, the pressure and the attention in Congress, um, the National Academy of Sciences is now looking at um, the science underlying EPA's risk assessments and underlying uh, NIMS's consultations to determine kind of who's right, basically. They're calling balls and strikes on the best available science. Um, and so that process has been underway for a few months now, I guess. It's yeah. uh, expected to take a good, yeah, last summer. Yeah. It's this expected fall, to, late fall. Yeah. Sure. Um, so it's expected to take about 18 months, and uh, they're going to come out with a study basically saying, here's what we think the best available science looks like for consultations. Um, and there have been kind of a series of presentations to the NAS committee that's been selected to, to review the science. Um, so we'll, we'll see where they come down on this. It's looking at some of the issues that MA highlighted with, you know, how, how EPA really looks at a much narrower range of issues and NIMS in contrast <coughs> looks at a much broader range of effects and really looks at kind of effects in the ecosystem <coughs> and considers baseline uh, of the species and all that. So. Um, so that will obviously be a very influential finding and, and recommendation when that does come out. Um, so that's where we're at with the pesticide and salmon litigation. And I will now turn it over to Colette to talk about some other species litigation. Okay. Oh. Well, I wanted cool. to, I just really, I felt like I, Glenn Spain is in the room, who's one yes. of the co-plaintiffs. And so. Who's been litigating since yeah. the very beginning on these issues. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Long standing commitment. And, and Jason is also connected. He, in about 2006, we got Defenders of Wildlife to involved in this in the salmon work. And it's great because they have a DC presence and they're able to help Earth Justice back in DC and fighting those riders, which is something that Glenn and I try to do but don't have the same power. So it's <laughs> So yeah, that's it. Scaling out. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm Colette adkins Geezy, and I'm an attorney at the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, I focus on amphibians and reptiles, and considering all the pesticide impacts on amphibians in particular because of their permeable skins, it was a good thing for CBD's herpetofauna attorney to work on. So I've been working on their pesticide cases since I started about a year and a half ago. But CBD's been working on these cases for uh, about a decade. We've in many ways just been kind of one step after um, the salmon litigation, kind of taking that litigation and then applying it in cases against um, EPA and now more recently against the Fish and Wildlife Service dealing with terrestrial species. And our first one was on the red-legged red frog, the California red-legged frog. And this was a Section 7 consultation case against uh, EPA. And we did have a battle on, um, on liability there. They had um, argued that we just couldn't establish that the pesticides may affect. That's the trigger, the legal trigger to have a, um, EPA have to do this initial effects determination. Um, we got a positive liability ruling there, and then we're able to settle with the agency to get a consultation schedule and some in, um, interim injunctive relief where there were restrictions on pesticide use. So the, um, the, the stipulation that we had worked out was to have seven to ten effects determinations per quarter on all these uh, 
pesticides that were affecting the red-legged frog, and then to enjoin the um, pesticide use in these buffers, 60-foot um, application buffers, which is quite small, but this is when application of pesticides by ground, and then a 200-foot buffer um, for aerial application of pesticides. Um, although these, those interim restrictions, those aren't label changes. You might remember um, Jason talking about um, FIFRA being this labeling statute. These are just court orders. Um, they're not an actual change to the pesticide label, which is important because EPA um, has refused to enforce these restrictions um, because they aren't actual label changes. Well, the next, uh, the next case then, we took it up, and first we started with just one species, the red-legged frog, and then we did another, um, the same case, but just a little bit bigger, against um, EPA, again, for failing to consult, this time on 11 Bay Area species. And that, this time, we ended up being able to just go right to a settlement with EPA. I mean, that's kind of getting the hint, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Several liability rulings in a row here that, you know what, um, your pesticide registrations are going to trigger uh, the consultation requirement under the ESA. So we got another um, settlement very similarly structured to the first one where we've got a consultation schedule and then some buffers um, where pesticides can't be applied. This one was three to four pesticides per quarter and, um, um, and similar buffers. Well, we were hoping each one of these times that EPA would, would just get the hint and um, reform their pesticides program and start hiring more staff to do uh, effects determinations on their, on their own here because they really have only been doing them in response to court orders, um, you know, and in many cases just court order stipulations. So we decided to, to go big this time and see if that would finally push the EPA to take this, um, to, to make this program a reform. We brought this national case. Um, with 212 species and 385 pesticides. That was filed um, at the beginning of last year, um, January of 2011. And um, we almost immediately went into uh, settlement negotiations with the EPA. So we've been doing that for about a year now. And we have made a lot of progress in those negotiations. Um, I can't talk about the substance of that, um, but I'll, I can just give you a little bit of the tenor which is EPA saying, you know what, this is a giant case, but you know what, that's still only just a fraction of our responsibility. Like, if we really need to start to do these for all pesticides, all species, this is a huge undertaking. And we don't have the staff, we don't have the money, our agency is consistently under threats um, as it is. We're just, you need to be patient with us here. But the problem is that we're, we already have decades of noncompliance, and it's taken so much work to get here. You know, she's, we've talked about case after case after case, win, 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 but still, you know, a decade later, you've got nothing on the ground that's helping these endangered species. So it's incredibly frustrating and difficult to be patient when they're really in blatant violation of the, of the law. So we'll, we'll see how that settlement works, I, you know, if, if we're going to get there or not. I, I, I'm feeling hopeful now. We've got pesticide registrants um, and pesticide user groups that have... Um, uh, been trying to intervene in the case, and we, we didn't object to their intervention on, on remedy, but um, we just last, well, a week and a half ago, got um, motions to intervene on um, merits, and they filed along with that a motion to dismiss the case, and they've got an argument that, uh, well, and I think the, court, the, the judge, I think, is going to let them make this argument, but I think he's going to wait until if we do have a settlement agreement, he's going to let them object to it, and he'll deal with their um, concerns then, but they, they're, the basis for their motion to dismiss is that we, um, we can't challenge these pesticides um, under the ESA. We should have brought it under FIFRA because even though it's a failure to consult claim under the ESA, it, according to them, it's, it's actually a challenge to the pesticide registrations. And FIFRA has an exclusive uh, review provision where you need to challenge the registration within 60 days of it getting registered, and you needed to bring that challenge into the Court of Appeals. Now, these registrations happened years ago for most of them, and, um, and the problem with that argument is that it pretty much was already decided in these um, earlier cases that Amanda was describing, but there's been a series of cases since then that haven't, um, only one case has addressed it directly, and it was just a District of Arizona case, and we're hoping that our judge won't think that that District of Arizona judge was very smart <laughs> because that um, it was the exact posture of a case. It was we brought that case brought ESA only claims, and the judge said 
those are all barred because you should have brought those claims under FIFRA. Um, so that, that's what I've been working on the last couple weeks is trying to get ready for our motion, our, you know, our opposition to that motion to dismiss. But I'm, I, I think it's a bad argument, and I think that we should be able to win that. And we've got a, a good judge, so we'll, we'll see. But um, the problem, though, even though with all these cases, we've got EPA agreeing to a consultation schedule, but this is just for EPA's half of the deal. So EPA puts together an effects determination. We need that to ever have some conservation value on the ground. We need the Fish and Wildlife Service to take that effects determination, turn it into a biop that has mitigation measures involved. Fish and Wildlife Service has just blatantly refused to do that. <clears throat> we've got a, um, letters between the agencies where EPA sends their effects determinations to the Fish and Wildlife Service, and, he, and Fish and Wildlife Service writes back and says, no, um, this is not sufficient to initiate consultation because your analysis is, ter is terrible. And we have some sympathy for that because, you know what, <laughs> EPA's analysis is pretty terrible. You know, this is what we've discussed here. They, they're not doing a good job looking at it. Um, sublethal effects, they're not looking at the mixture of pesticides that these species are um, exposed to. But it's a little bit of a difficult position because um, we're never going to get there unless Fish and Wildlife Service just starts to do this analysis. So we've got these agencies pointing fingers at each other, and so we brought the, the next case here, <laughs> which is to, um, is to sue Fish and Wildlife Service now for failure to, um, to um, complete their consultations with them. There's a 90-day deadline in the ESA that once you've, the, the action agency, the EPA, has initiated consultation, Fish and Wildlife Service needs to um, uh, move forward with it. That's, uh, this is our red-legged frog case number two, because we're, we've just brought those on all the effects determinations that EPA did under that first case. So we, um, we brought that case um, in fall of last year, and we've entered some negotiations with Fish and Wildlife Service. We also brought a jeopardy claim against EPA, arguing that their failure to, um, uh, to, to complete consultation is, is resulting in insufficient protections of, all, uh, of the red-legged frog. That's not a great, uh, a great claim, um, but the claim against Fish and Wildlife Service is pretty solid. They're, they've got a one minor defense, which is they think that they're, this case is precluded by some language in our first settlement agreement. Um, I don't think it is. But what they say to us, and again, can't talk about the substance of what they've offered in terms of settlement, but they're just saying, you know what, we just have no possible capacity to do this. We are just swamped as an agency. And you know what? When it comes to these pesticides, these are, you know, we're going to get challenged by the pesticide industry. NIMPS, they've got way more resources than we do. They put together these hundreds of pages of giant biops, you know, with fantastic analysis. We've got two people in the D.C. office that are set to do pesticide biops. And um, we can't even deal with your red-legged frog. And pretty soon you're, we're gonna, you're gonna sue us on the Bay Area case. And now you're gonna sue us on all the pesticide um, effects determinations that come out of the national case. We can't possibly do it. What do you want out of us? <laughs> and, you know, hire more people. And they're like, what? You know, budget constraints. So, so it's, a, and it's a difficult position because I have some, uh, we have sympathy for the Fish and Wildlife Service when they say if EPA would just, they're, they're the experts on this toxicology stuff and the pesticides, why can't they give us a decent effects determination so we can actually do a buyout that's going to be decent? But um, we're hoping that this NAS process, the National Academy of Science study that um, Amanda had talked about, will, will bring some relief there where we've got um, you know, a, a panel of scientific experts that says, that says this is what needs to happen in an effects determination, this is what needs to happen in a buyout. And we'll hopefully get these um, agencies prompted into action. Um, yeah, but in the meantime, I just we part of the reason why we brought this suit is we just feel like you can't wait anymore. You know, we just can't keep on waiting. Um, you know, now they say wait another year and a half for NAS to come out. At some point, you just need to have um, these agencies be put under a court-ordered schedule so that they start hiring additional <laughs> staff and start plugging through them. Um, I think that's all I want to, to say. If I could just add one thing before we go to questions, that just to follow up on, on something Colette said about this this jurisdictional battle that is brewing in the courts over uh, whether you need to sue under FIFR or under the ESA for violations of the consultation provisions, it's particularly insidious because um, the ESA requires that you give 60 days notice before you sue an agency for failing to consult. FIFR requires that you sue within 60 days, <laughs> so do the math. <laughs> So you end up, if, if the if FIFRA ends up trumping the ESA uh, and, and this takes hold, and there have been a couple of courts now that have suggested that it does, then uh, you may not be able to bring a Section 7 consultation claim. And that's squarely at odds with the Washington Toxics line of cases that you know we've been talking about. But um, 
you know, it's just part of the strategy, and it's a big, big issue that we need to be back. Yeah, I, I think before we jump as some make sure. Does anyone else want to throw in any last thoughts before we move into questions? Yeah. I like just a couple of things, and maybe this group of people, this isn't that interesting, but when I, when we first brought these lawsuits in 2000, one of the big things that, you know, Glenna and ourselves and everyone working on, what we, what we did is we, the information that we brought to the court was government information. We said, here's EPA's re-registration eligibility decision, and these are the risks that they show, and this is, and we actually used their less than adequate science to demonstrate a risk and then say, but EPA, even though they recognize there are some problems, they haven't consulted. And same thing with the interim measures. When we brought, when we first got the on-the-ground protections being, they were court-ordered. But what it was is we looked at voluntary measures the government had already established to reduce pesticide exposure to endangered species. And I think that was a key piece because the reality is that the courts are going to defer to an agency. And so if we were to bring outside peer review data, at some point the courts would feel like we're not scientists. We're looking at the law. And so the, I think it was really important that the data we brought was all coming from the agencies that we were suing. And that's, I don't know, that might be like obvious to you guys. But I was coming out of, you know, totally different realm. And the other piece that we're dealing with, um, just, just, you know, we talked about how the fact that these biological opinions are getting weaker. There is an intimidation factor. I really feel that Fish and Wildlife Service has been intimidated after these industry lawsuits against the National Marine Fishery Service. I mean, they were pretty intense, well, and it was exhausting. Yeah. And they just say it out loud, like, we know we are going to get sued, and we yeah. need to make these giant things. we got two people. <laughs> so we're small. I don't know, but one of the things we are doing is we, we, uh, complete, we have a, we're in the process of a FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, request with National Marine Fishery Service we want to know how it is that you've made the, how you weaken these biops. We want to understand it. Let's just, let, we want this justified. Because if you can't justify it, we're going to challenge it. And they have thanked us at every step of the way. Oh. I mean, when we, every case we've brought, I get anonymous emails from home, <laughs> you know, from people saying, and, oh, well, you know, I'm linked in this way, and I just want to thank you. So, I mean, I feel like the people at the agencies recognize what they're up against. And anyway, so the FOIA is also coming, and we'll see where that goes. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, so yeah Well, um, basically, I think you should add people to your endangered species. Exactly. Uh, one in three, they say, will soon be getting cancer. My daughter came down, I believe, because of herbicide, herbicide use at her home. She came down with non Hodgkin's lymphoma. And we know one research project after another is that they're connected. But nothing's done. I and mean, you go to any store and you get the same herbicide. And um, I don't, all our money goes to cancer society, it goes to breast cancer, after for cure. But there's nothing for prevention. I think you're the only organization I know, your group, that really talk about prevention. And I don't know of any others that do. Even this huge amount of money going into cancer uh, research is all cure, not prevention. Yeah, no, we and absolutely. I really um, would like you to think about being a cancer prevention group and people. Because people are an endangered, there are whole clusters of communities that everyone comes down with cancer. No, I, I and absolutely. it's sort of a, a joke in a way, but it's not a, a nice joke. Can when everyone hear what you're yeah. saying? I really hope that we are setting a precedent because, I mean, as I said, if they have to do this for salmon, if they actually have to look at yeah. sublethal indirect effects, then they, they have to do it for humans too. They absolutely. And I really. No, they don't. No, they don't because the Endangered Species Act has teeth. And you know, Safe Drinking Water Act, and all the we don't have the same power. You're we're really right, and I'm sorry. You get almost no money in your funding mm -hmm. in comparison to what you're fighting. But luckily, relief that we get under the Endangered Species Act will help humans too, because it's going to keep pesticides out of our waterways. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. no, absolutely. It's all, it is true that the American Cancer Society and health organizations, medical associations, have been helping us in Congress to fight some of these riots. Mm -hmm. Bring 
this right down to a human health issue. And we try to do that in all of our media. We try to do that. Uh, there's salmon in the food. Uh, you know, and, and anything that affects a river that salmon are in will affect drinking water supply. Well, I never hear. I never hear the connection. And I never so see the American Society. Uh, cancer Society speak up at any meeting. They, they, they do need to be more proactive, and if you remember that organization, start speaking to them about that. I would never go on. <laughs> no, go well, on. Um, That's what you do. Some, some of us should. Raise the issue. Okay. Well, maybe you're right. I'm just curious along those lines um, where it comes behind the, like if the same company who are making this side of these kinds of things as well. Like mm -hmm. Bear pharmaceuticals, bear crop science. Yeah, there's a definitely a very yeah. there's an extended relationship between petrochemical companies, um, uh, pesticide manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies. They basically have a really kind of sick, slick scheme going in which they make the pesticides and make us sick, and then they make the chemotherapies and make us well. And have all the research on it. Um, I have a question or at least a comment. My concern is that uh, the trying to link Highway 36 study that's being conducted under the auspices of Governor Kinsaber, the New York Health Authority, um, 72 people at least have shown up, including children, have shown up with 214 in their urine. The earlier study conducted by Dr. Dana Barr, uh, spring a year ago, uh, showed up 36 people with um, both atrazine and 214. Both of these are not only um, endocrine disruptors and epilepsy herbicides, Hormone disruptors, those type of things, um, uh, Tuberty's history, and I, I apparently in the late 90s they changed it, but up until the late 90s, 24D, as well as its sister, 245T, had um, TC, DD dioxin manufacturing byproducts in them, which got into the salmon, which got into the creeks after being sprayed all over Western Oregon. So um, there's an obvious relationship between all of this. And I completely appreciate all of your work so deeply, I can't explain it, because you're picking at the little nuances here and trying to get the law to actually address what we're experiencing in communities on the ground, which is that hundreds and hundreds of people are sick, thousands of people are sick from these pesticides, and um, doctors are not trained to identify pesticide poisoning, nobody ever talks about it, people are isolated in the rural environments and they're sick and they don't know why. So um, my concern comes down to the fact that no one's looking. I talked to talk, two top, top toxicologists in November at the uh, Triangle Lake uh, Open House put on my OHA. Nobody there is, uh, those toxicologists acknowledge the dioxin poisoning. They said nobody's looking at the DOPs, that there's, there's just organic pollutants of, like, such as the dioxins in the streets. Uh, there's no money for it. Yet we know that, if I believe, that's what's affecting the salmon because I have half a mile of salmon creek on my property and I've watched them decline over the last 30 years. We recently, just this week, went up to Salem to um, ask uh, Dr. Governor Kitzhaber to please place a moratorium on all forestry pesticide, knowing that they're showing up in the residents of Triangle Lake and that 214 and is being used all over the uh, state because we're getting all the uh, uh, subscriptions. Um, and looking at what they're using in addition to the inerts and all the rest of them. But, so we're, we're looking at the bigger picture, you know? And you're looking at the nuanced picture. How do we figure out ways to work together, to push on the politicians who do have the executive authority, such as Governor Kitzhaber, to just put a hold on the pesticides until they can prove there's no harm? How do we figure out ways to make this all work? Because he does have the, the power to do it. And we talked to his natural resources director on Tuesday, up at a um, uh, uh, Oregon Forestry Research Institute conference in Corvallis, which is about as opposite from Elo as you could possibly find on the planet. We were aliens there, but we <laughs> want to know what they're thinking and how they think. And it's basically PhDs and BS and craziness, madness. And um, so I want to know how we can all work together, uh, grassroots from the bigger picture saying, we're out here, we're hurting our children at 24D, you guys nuancing uh, every aspect of the law and trying to find a way in. And you know, where does Lisa Jackson come in? She hears on all the 
talk shows as being a progressive, you know, those kind of things. So this is getting pretty broad, but I, I think well, that the question is really how do we move from looking at these specific issues and apply that to a bigger picture of what's actually happening to people in communities? So because it uh, is happening. You guys have more thoughts on that. Exactly what Ruth says, but it's very specific now. They have proof. Well, yeah. Doing I would. That, I would. I would make a suggestion. Okay. One is find out what's in your own water supply. Get it documented. Uh, take it to the water boards. The water boards often are public entities. They are very concerned about. This. They have the power to make a stink. And if you start with where you are in your watershed, find out what's in that water, uh, and find out what they're testing for, and especially what they're not testing for, because the tests are expensive and they only test for certain things. Exactly. If you start there, I think you can start a real groundswell on the public health issue in your own area with the backing of the water board. Don't bring along your electricity. These, wa these water boards, these watershed boards don't have the funding. I was up in uh, They may not have the funding, uh, but they can't have they the, have the power. power. They don't have the, the funding to do it. They don't test for some of these things. They just look for the, right. for the basic things, bacteria and yeah. the right. nitrates well, and things like that. That, that work with them to see that they can get the funding, <coughs> see that they have support on that, and then when you have results that look Where are you going to get the funding? You look around any way you can. Uh, that's an issue you do. I'm by Adam Marsh and I want to share more about the board. So, before we move on to the next question, do you guys have anything to add into that discussion? Please, I'd like to hear from you. I guess I, I look at it as there's um, the federal government, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency regulates pesticides under FIFRA. And the Endangered Species Act, in many ways, has to overlay that. Clean Water Act has to overlay that. So you start, you do, you work there, and you work at the community level to set precedent at community level and making changes at the community level as well. And so if we're setting precedent at a federal level to force changes in the way EPA is evaluating things, you know, we're working on efforts to, for example, right now EPA can, say, decide that a pesticide has there's the benefits of a pesticide, even if there are non-chemical and other solutions out there that are feasible and effective. But they can say, this pesticide is still a value and will still accept environmental and human health risks, even though we could be doing something better. We don't have to have that chemical even on the market. So working to change the way EPA is doing things is a big part of what we're doing. Being on the ground in your community and saying, hey, there's a risk out here, is a huge part of recognizing why, you know, that is a justification. If you weren't, if there, if the, I mean, it's, it's not an appropriate way of having it, but the people are out there suffering, and we can force federal changes and force changes in how regulations are in place because, because of the blatant and obvious concerns that are out there. Uh, I want to, I want to circle back. There's so much, and I think we only have 10 more minutes. Yeah, uh, we do have about 10 more minutes, and I want to make sure, too, that we have time to address more specific questions about Endangered Species Act. Um, so I think you were next. Um, well, it's not on the Endangered Species Act, but if you want to defer to this question, it's fine. But has anybody brought a tort claim against the pesticide manufacturers, either the fisheries industry, think mm -hmm. economically, or humans who clearly have, you know, pesticides in their urine? Is there a way to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that's a really interesting <laughs> question. There are a couple of others that have done that, and that's a battery thing. Thank you. I'm sorry. A battery or a salt claim, yeah. Uh, there are a couple of lawyers who have done that. It comes to a lot of bullshit because yeah. you're about battery, it, you know, it basically, uh, if you have a lot of different contributors, I forget what the, the document is, if you have a lot of different contributors to a farm, they're all guilty. Yeah. Joint several liability. Joint several liability, and then it's up to them to point the finger to each other. That's a huge tool. So they can join what? Joint several liability. Joint several liability. They're you all just guilty. throw them all in a bucket and let them work. So I'll mention, too, that we have another panel tomorrow that's going to address some questions like that. And one of the panelists is an attorney from Portland named Larry Sokol, who I believe handles uh, cases exactly like that. Exactly. So that would be a good forum to bring that up again, perhaps. And that's uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2.30. Thank you. Do you have a question? Um, yeah, I was um, interested in terms of um, finding out what kind of strategies are you using, given this downward weakening of biops and given the, the comment Obviously, on bio, what kind of strategies are you implementing to try to build the record for litigation so that when you do have this um, downward shifting of bio, that has something in the record that you can point to? Um, 
point to, especially given that it is problematic, given the deferential standard to agency science mm -hmm. to get your own experts into fix there? Um, well, first of all, while, uh, while you're right that under the ESA, uh, notice and comment isn't required on a biop, uh, the practice for all of these pesticide biops has been for the agency to make drafts public and to accept comments uh, on those and uh, to respond in some degree to those. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is an opportunity to kind of um, to, to put our concerns forward in that process. Um, and, you know, I think, um, I think a lot of it, I, Lawsuits uh, upholding the, the stronger initial biops, I think, really help kind of bolster their initial approach. And I think, you know, we're as as I may mention, we're kind of kind of look at the rationale for weakening the biops, and certainly a you know a challenge to some of the weaker ones. Some some of the aspects we think that were unjustifiably weakened is a, a real possibility, and um, that would hopefully help <laughs> help steer them back in the right direction. But it's just, you know, they've got they've got so much pressure coming from one side. So everything that we can do, um, you know, through litigation or, you know, in other other ways to kind of put some more pressure from the other side back on and say, no, you know, the science you're using really is is correct and, and don't water it down. Um, I think it's have you gone so far as to, for example, hire experts to submit expert testimony during that comment process or even well, um, it, it is. It's all. It, yeah, it's always going to be early to say for sure. But we, yes, we have hired expertise um, from other scientists to provide input into the biological opinions, and we also ourselves have provided input into every one of the biological, all the draft biological opinions, um, and I, I think an industry is doing the same tenfold, hundredfold of what we're doing, um, it's hard to say where it's going to go. But definitely that pressure has made an impact. And we, I think it probably is going to have to take it back to the courts to explain that the Endangered Species Act is worst case scenario. And the way industry is presenting their science, they are looking at best case scenario. And it's amazing that they will can create their, you know, their protocols and their methodology in order to find the answer that they already wanted to have. And I recognize that I'm to some extent doing that, but I'm also un acting under the guise of the Endangered Species Act that we're supposed to be looking at worst case scenario. So it's. Are, are you people from the. Are you pushing this on the federal level? I missed some of this in the beginning. Are you from more on the federal level or state level? And some of these are water quality and buffer zones, are they a state by state thing or you're not imposing this on the federal level yet? And Washington and Oregon and California have different. It's actually, it is federal, <laughs> and the reasonable and prudent measures and reasonable and prudent alternatives that have been, pro that are, um, that have come out of these biological opinions are, they pertain to the habitat of endangered species well, throughout. So it's well, Washington, Oregon, and California, and generally, Idaho. and Idaho, mm -hmm. yep, will all have the same, they've all been prescribed similar biological, or similar buffers. So, so the water quality, there are buffer zones in effect right now in the, in the say, in the forest or agriculture air and the residential area. Is there buffer zones in effect in these states? There are, but they are the interim measures, which were court ordered, and they're only for a small, at least in the salmon cases. There are other interim measures for others. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're hoping for is long-term measures that actually can have, um, can, can be, can are more enforceable and can create greater so compliance. The fish are more important, they're more protected than, than, than human beings yeah. than animals. Like it's pretty animals. ridiculous that the Endangered Species Act is more powerful, and I and I it, and I hope that we can set that precedent because it's not it shouldn't be that way. I yeah. said, I think maybe before you I came in, we point. talked about farm workers are salmon too. Yeah. Gentleman down here had a question, and then I want to mention yeah. uh, we've only got about five minutes left, so the CLE form is going around. We need to make sure that we find that and that you folks have a chance to sign it. Um, two, two questions. Sure. Have you considered using the ESA Section 7D provision uh, for, to stop the permit applicant or the agency from the air treatable kind of resources until the consultations are complete? Number two, since the judge agreed with you that counterpart regulations were invalid, are those regulations still in the books and why? 
Um, uh, the second part of that first, the, there are portions of the counterpart regulations that were vacated and portions of them that are <coughs> still on the books, but the, the particularly problematic part um, was vacated. In terms of 7D. Let me take that one, because uh, I actually have a case that um, provides an interesting sort of practice lesson for any of you attorneys. Uh, I brought a case against EPA for failing to consult on Rosol, which is a which is chlorfacinone, which is used against prairie dogs. Uh, it's a blood thinner. Uh, it's spread all over the West. Uh, prairie dogs eat it. They slowly bleed to death. They're scavenged by raptors, uh, which then, um, it, it's, it's a gift that keeps on giving. Then whatever eats the prairie dog gets the same, the same poison in their own bloodstream and reduces their fitness. Um, I sued uh, and, uh, and, and tried to negotiate a settlement with, with EPA. Uh, NRDC later sued as well, and the cases were consolidated. Judge came out with a bizarre ruling that actually threw out my case because I it did not include a 7D claim. And during the course of the case, of, of the, of the case uh, EPA had agreed to begin consultation but had not completed it. So I filed a motion for reconsideration and explained why my complaint did in fact address the circumstance that, that I had that we were in and was allowed back into the case. Uh, but it was a lesson for me to say that, that, that yeah, if you're going to sue under Section 7 for failure to consult, EPA now is routinely entering into these sort of open-ended agreements to consult and then going to court and saying, oh, look, we're consulting. Your case is moot. So include your 7D claim so that no judge will come back and say, well, you know, no, consultation actually has to be completed. <laughs> and until consultation is completed, the pesticide should actually be enjoined. Um, there's only been two cases so far that I know of where we've been successful in actually getting a pesticide registration rescinded uh, or enjoined pending the completion of, of uh, consultation. One was brought by NRDC. It was a spirotetrament case involving bees out of the Southern District of New York. And the other one was my partial victory in Rosol, uh, where we at least got EPA to pull um, the use of Rosol in four states that they had not consulted on. Um, the judge would not pull the registration for the other states because those had been operating under state special local needs permits. And uh, this is a whole other thing we won't, we won't get into, but I'm happy to talk about states do also play a role in pesticide registration. Uh, they do issue their own permits for, for uh, compounds that are already registered for different uses. Um, and so to the extent that there are state issues with uh, use, you know, there, that's another place where people should be politically active and astute because EPA just rubber stamps every state special local need permit. In Rosal case, and I'll stop in a second. Um, EPA did, in its effects determination for Rosol, determine that uh, the way to apply Rosol most safely would be to hand bait prairie dog burrows so that you get the poison six inches down in, in, into the burrow so that there's less opportunity for secondary poisoning due to other birds or mammals that might, might find the bait and eat it. Well, two or three states have issued special local needs permits saying, no, we think mechanical baiting is better. Well, it's a heck of a lot faster. There are some studies that say it's less precise, uh, which would then increase secondary poisoning. But here we have EPA actually saying, all right, if you're going to apply this thing, here are some strictures. And the states issue these permits saying, no, we don't like those strictures. We're going to let you do whatever you want. And then EPA approves them. And I've tried, to, I've tried to get EPA to deny those, saying, hey, this is a blatant violation of your own registration that you've issued. And um, uh, so far, so far, no luck. So, so just to clarify, 7D requires completion of consultation, or what is it? 70 uh, prohibits the irretrie irretrievable commitment of resources pending the completion of a consultation. Okay. So, a for yeah, it can be a basis for, for an injunction. That's right. Yeah. We're out of time. I think we need to make room for the next panel to move in. So, I want to thank our panelists. Thank you.